Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Open Line Ask the Medical Expert. Uh, let's talk about professionals walking you through the ways to deal with barriers. So if we mean by barriers, barriers to treatment, um, one of the biggest barriers is patient engagement. So you may recognize that your loved one has a problem, but your loved one may not be willing to recognize that they have a problem yet. That's not terribly uncommon. Um, and so we have a number of ways that we can help deal with that. Uh, we work very closely hand in hand with some extremely reputable, very well, um, well received uh, interventionists um, who work with both the family. So there's intervent there are types of interventions where um, it really is about the family. Um, and it's about um, teaching the family to deal with whatever behaviors are going on, even when the person who's struggling with the disorder isn't quite ready to be in that conversation. Um, again, the importance of dealing with family dynamics, the psychoeducation piece, and involving the, entire, the patient's entire ecosystem, even sometimes when the patient's not ready to be involved in it. You know, another thing at uh, Foundations Recovery Network is you all have kind of a motto, I guess, if you will, lifetime relationships for long-term recovery. Can you explain this to folks? Yeah, tonight? so that's actually our purpose. Our purpose, the reason that we exist is to develop lifetime relationships for long-term recovery. That's wonderful. So um, long-term recovery is, um, it's a lifetime process. Um, in fact, if you think about the chronic diseases, you know, you think of, of high blood pressure, you think of diabetes, these are not um, come and go disorders. It's, it's a process and, and there's going to be ups and downs. Um, and when you find a good doctor, let's say you find a good dentist, right? Every time you need to go to the dentist, you don't find a new dentist, right? You stick with the dentist that you like and that has worked with you. And so we want to be that. We want to be that partner for people that are dealing with mental health disorders, that are dealing with substance use disorders and, and their families. Um, we want to it's an honor. It's an honor and a privilege for us to be able to participate in that journey, um, to walk families through this, um, and to be the support and, um, and the go-to for somebody who is struggling with these diseases. That's a really great analogy of looking at that. That's very true. You don't Thanks. go to a different dentist every time. Right? You, you seek the help and uh, then you stick with it. And that's, uh, like I said, it's the motto. It's the reason yeah. for the, uh, yeah. So um, let's talk about, we earlier were discussing uh, the opioid crisis, but there's also kind of a new epidemic that is really, I wouldn't call it an epidemic, but it's been uh, really in the news a lot lately. A lot of light has been shed on this very serious issue. And that's the you know topic of suicide. We've had two high profile folks mm. in the making recent headlines and I think it's important to discuss that this evening um, first of all um, you know all of a sudden we are seeing a lot of these being covered in the news uh, of course it's a high profile situation and mm. let's touch base on that uh, unfortunately there is statistics showing that there is a rise in suicide right here in the US and that's an unfortunate statistic but we do need to discuss it tonight yeah so Center for Disease Control um, has been putting out a great deal of information recently because suicide is on the rise um, so that is um, and, and in in these high profile cases and in general what we're seeing is um, about a third of them um, of people who've committed suicide recently have opiates in their their um, in their bloodstream um, so there's a there's a relationship there there's a really strong relationship um, and one of the key features of that relationship is also the hopelessness so the hopelessness the isolation that accompanies substance use disorder um, is also found in depression mm -hmm. and um, is is the impetus or um, you know, in the background of these suicides. You know, I want to go back one second to the, the lifetime relationships now that you bring that piece up and that hopelessness piece. Um, because the key feature of, of addiction disorders, you know, and that hopelessness, one of it, it's, it's, one of them is isolation, is that feeling of nobody's going to understand. Maybe, maybe it's the shame that um, that you've been using, and you just can't. You want to stop. You wish you could stop. You wish you could be there for your kids. You know, um, all of that, and you just can't because your brain has literally been hijacked. Um, so, relation. It's it that the opposite of that relate of that isolation though is the building of relationships. And it's inside of building relationships, building community, um, becoming related to other people, and, and again to yourself even, you know, that we find long-term recovery. Um, in the research out there, one of the most important reasons why people, um, that, that supports people in making long-term positive changes in their life,
is the quality of the relationships in their life. And so, again, you know, back to um, lifetime relationships for long-term recovery to, to help people build and nurture those quality, positive relationships in their life. That's a big part of, of what we mean by that. And you know, maybe you're just tuning in with us tonight. I want to go ahead and kind of reiterate what we are discussing this evening. Uh, we're with Foundations Recovery Network. This is Siobhan Morse, uh, obviously the expert tonight, not myself, Siobhan is, says she's our medical expert this evening. And this is such a great show because uh, we want to welcome you into this conversation. The number is right there on your screen all evening, the 615-737-PLUS number. You can call in, even just share a story if you don't have a question. Mm -hmm. But if you do have a question for us, uh, we want you to know that you most certainly can give us a call and we'd love to get to that. Uh, the topic again, if you, someone you know maybe, um, changes in behavior, struggling mm -hmm. with addiction or any, any sort of mental health illnesses. That's what the topic is this evening. And of course, it, you know, suicide is uh, definitely a topic that um, we are seeing a lot of recently. And just want to ask your personal opinion. When you see these stories making headlines mm -hmm. in the news, what is going through your mind as someone who is an expert in this type of field? Um, so my first thought is how sad. How amazingly sad that somebody who has everything that that you know, or seems to have everything that we all think is going to um, going to fix us right or going to fix our lives or if only my life was like this or like that um, would feel so hopeless so isolated and so desperate that they would rather be dead than feel the way that they feel um, just the profound sadness of that um, and then in all honesty, the second piece that I, I, I think of is hopefully this tragedy can help somebody else, you know, because this is a high profile case. It sheds light. It brings it to the forefront. You know, suddenly we see a bunch of news stories um, and, and it, it enters into the conversation. And, um, and maybe it can remove a little bit of the stigma, um, a room, remove a little bit of the fear or shame of somebody who is feeling like maybe they want to die or they want to hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they can be courageous enough to state that and get some help. Well, we do have Charles on the line. Hi, Charles. Thanks for calling in this evening. What would you like to say? Well, I'd like to say that I've had schizophrenia since mm -hmm. April of 1998. I've been in the hospital twice and jail three times when I was unmedicated and homeless. And now the people in the government, they can't be making these cutbacks about less social work, less case management, not having a social worker if you don't have sin kill. I have a lot of friends who are still on the streets and not getting the services they need, and they call on me. The end of the result is that we're going to end up back in the hospitals, yeah. which will cost insurance even more money. And for me, I find commitment, and that's just what the government should not want, more money to pay for inpatients instead of outpatients, and not let us lead independent lives where many of us are how functional, don't need to be in the group homes. I live independently. I'm very capable of taking care of myself. I'm in college. I have a job. I drive. I even have a cat, which is a salt animal. I'm proud of myself mm -hmm. and try to empower others to follow my secret of success when mm -hmm. I've been there to walk the walk and talk the talk. Thank you so That's much great. for the call. We appreciate it. That's great. Wow. Congratulations, Charles. That's fabulous. Um, what a story of hope. Yes, of right? course. We love so, that. Yeah. So, um, and, and that's the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's what long-term recovery looks like. You know, um, being able to admit that you need help, going and getting the help, and then just like you said, you know, walking the talk and doing, doing the real deal. Great job. That was a great call. We appreciate that. Again, thank you for your call tonight, Charles. Uh, so what are some important features of just good treatment? Let's go over that tonight. So um, uh, let's see. There's, so, there's a number of things that you're going to want to look for. So if you're looking for treatment for a loved one or for yourself, um, you're going to want to make sure that the treatment is individualized. What that means is that every single person that comes through the treatment center or um, you know, the, the service provider receives a full assessment and receives a treatment plan that is based on the results of that assessment. So that's kind of baseline starting point. Um, you want to look at the level of uh, training and expertise of the staff. So maybe master's level therapists, licensed or licensed eligible, how many PhD CIDs do they have on property, um, do, do they have psychiatrists, do they have specialists that come and support. Um, you also want to look to see um, 
are they are they following their patients mm -hmm. so what types of outcomes do they have long term how do they get those outcomes um, and how do they report those outcomes how do they use that outcome information so for example it's really nice to be able to say oh we talked to 50 patients and they're doing great or to have that you know testimonial um, everyone loves a testimonial it pulls at your heart you know the story of hope right um, but it, does it apply? Is it the, the experience of the average patient? And looking to see if they're able to report that kind of information, um, because that's really what is helpful in basing those decisions. That's what you should be looking for. Uh, we have William now Great. on the line. Hi, William. Thank you for calling in. Yes, uh, I'm calling in because I have a problem. And if my pro if a problem is caused by the government, or is something that somebody needs. Let's say you need a job, and that causes you a depression and a lot of problems. How do you go to the psychiatrist and tell them that? Or if your family know that, that this is a problem you have and you cannot solve it. So how does one become a mental issue that needs to be solved? Unless you get what you want. If I get what I need now, then I don't have a problem. I have a problem because I cannot get what I need. It was taken away from me by the United States government, and that's my problem. So how can you solve that problem? Thank you for the call, William. We appreciate it. Can you touch base on that? Um, so I'm going to go with vocational and life skill training. Okay. Right? So um, especially in our young adult um, populations, um, and as well. Uh, one of the, the areas that addiction and mental health can touch is the ability to access resources, to um, manage your finances, to have finances to manage through you know um, gainful employment. It can be very difficult to to manage all of those um, pieces when you're struggling in the depths of a depression or you know of a mental health illness or a substance use disorder. So a big part you know inside of the conversation of what to look for in treatment, are they able to help with this? Are they going to uh, um, have conversations with you about about some of the life skills maybe that you might be lacking or that you need support in. Um, if you are, you know, so there was, um, there's a conversation also about that functional addict piece. And so I have a job, I'm fine. It doesn't matter what I'm using. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, but is the treatment center that you're looking at going to support you in, um, in keeping that job? How are they gonna help you? Are you gonna be able to, um, in a controlled way, access um, and, and you know sort of transition back into your work life. So how are they going to support you in, um, in all that life skill management? Great advice and we have, as always appreciate those calls coming in this evening. Mm -hmm. We're going to go ahead and take another quick break. Keep it right here on News Channel 5 Plus. We'll be right back.